so you mentioned NVC, and for those who don't know, that's nonviolent communication. Uh, yep. Weren't they trying to rebrand it as something? Compassionate communication. Compassionate communication. Okay. Hasn't yeah. caught on very much yet. Yeah. For, uh, I in guess my it's mind. Because cause when you throw nonviolent out, people are just like, oh, violence? I don't want to talk about I don't right. speak violently. <laughs> How dare you tell me I speak violently? Right. It's just right. that language of demands versus requests and right. being really right. in touch with your feelings and your needs. Yeah. So it's good stuff. So, so I'm, I'm curious. Some of the democratic schools have very formal procedures to write things up and, you know, around conflict, but then others have uh, leaned more into uh, forms of mediation, NVC being one. Do, do you have like a, a formal aspect as well? Yeah, we use both. With a lot of conflicts, it's just going to be a micro circle. You're just going to be in the mm. moment going, you come and you come and we're going to listen to you and we're going to listen to you and you're going to listen to each other. And what did you hear them say? And what did you mm. hear them say? And all of that really on the ground takes a couple of minutes, happens. Um, when conflict is bigger and deeper and mainly require more time, we will do a more formal map. It still mm. follows those kind of procedures where we'll write a piece of paper and we'll put the problem in the middle and it's mm. got to be reduced to one word. The problem is bossing or mm. it's sharing or it's, I don't know, bossing tends to come up a lot in my room. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll you'll map each of the people's feelings and needs and um, you'll listen to everyone before you get to any agreements or solutions mm. and you'll all sign it and then we'll revisit that map in time and go, remember we had that meeting and we all agreed that when this happened we'd try these strategies. Is that working? Can we revisit it? Mm. That formal process still follows the same principles yeah. of okay. everyone being heard but it the formality comes from making time and space mm. to really listen to each other um, sometimes we've done conflict maps where we've taken the kids outside of school to like a cafe mm. or um, to the local park so that they're just physically outside of the environment where the conflict is happening mm. and they can connect to each other in a different way um, that's a really successful strategy in general, it's making space for it to be quiet and safe and mm -hmm. making sure that the adults who are facilitating that are really well-trained and aware that it's not their job to solve the problem, but yeah. to help each <laughs> other to listen to the problems. Most with younger people, lots of conflicts are actually just solved. With, with anyone, lots of conflicts are actually just transformed i've got to stop saying solved that's not yeah. <laughs> a thing but you know they're transformed by hearing and listening and you'll be surprised mm. how often i mean you wouldn't be surprised at all but how often just hearing the problem makes it just seem less it just takes the heat right. out of it when you can hear each other we do tend to do a lot of that work that some people would be like oh that's maybe taking a lot of time away from other things but mm. when you do that work often and frequently and give it a priority you give it as much space as you give to academics or to running around on the oval then you don't have the bigger problems right. and what you're hoping for is kids who get completely skilled in it so that they don't need you to do that they can do that right. for themselves and you can do that in their own lives and we do get that we do get kids who can just do it and go oh yeah I've got this that's worth mm -hmm. a while yeah nice nice yeah and that's one of the things that one of the benefits of a mature program <laughs> it's been around for decades yeah is you is you know continuity tends to build skills within that larger group and you know and and, and keeps them fresh and you know yeah. i alive. think the trust yeah. is a factor with a long-term mm. pro program too is that the t we're very lucky in that we have staff who've been here for a long time i've been at pine for 18 years and i am not the longest serving staff at the mm -hmm. moment i've got you know i've got teachers who've been here 25 years 27 years wow. we've got fresh staff as well we've got a pretty big team um, Amaris, our principal, has been here really, really a very long time and she's an amazing gatekeeper of our culture, but which innovates as well. But I think that's the trust that you can have when you go, actually, guys, it's going to be okay. This is going to mm -hmm. work. We've seen it work with multiple children. We've seen it work over hundreds of times. Give it space, give it time. Whereas when you're in a new mm. program, you've got everyone going, well, how do you know it's going to work? How do you know <laughs> they're not going to just not know anything and not be able to do anything? And you can't point to the success of right, years. Right. <laughs> so it, it can be harder to have that faith. Mm -hmm. This is the Agentic Schools Vodcast 
where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. What makes education possible is the satisfaction of psychological needs. So that is what these schools have in common with all others. What makes a school agentic is satisfying those needs particularly well. I'm your host, Don Burr.